Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here and I want to thank the organizers for organizing this nice conference with a lot of nice people. And I will be departing a bit from the main subject of uh, this conference. So there will be ODEs, uh, there will be integrable models, but they are not connected in the ODE in the usual way. So, and also gentle is a kind of a honeypot. I mean, I, tr I will try to be gentle, but I'm not sure as much that I will manage to be really gentle, but yeah, stay with me. So it's based on a series of work that I had done with, mainly with uh, Roberto Tateo and Riccardo Conti, and there are works in progress with Sasha Zamolochikov and Roberto and Riccardo. Okay, so for an introduction. First of all, since this will be kind of an introductory talk, not, most of you probably didn't hear about uh, this deformation. They don't know what's the bar and everything. I will, um, I will go through the title in order, and then I will present the, uh, the TT bar flow, so it, this deformation and the main properties. And then I will talk about some generalization for higher charges and some extended conclusion and mainly outlook, so what's left to be done with this theory, what's interesting. <coughs> um, it's fine? Okay. All right, so. <laughs> okay. So what is 2D? I think everyone agrees on this. This is just a set of notation, essentially. So I will be uh, working mainly on flat Euclidean space, so with, with C mainly, using both Cartesian and complex coordinate, depending on the need. And uh, I might want to move to Minkowski at some point by doing some big rotation in this way, so analytic continuation. And when uh, I might need also to compactify the space on a cylinder or on a torus, choosing two uh, non-parallel um, uh, non vector, x1 and x2 in, um, in R2. And finally, let me mention this. This is an interesting property of the antisymmetric tensor. It's valid only in 2D, and it's extremely useful for finding the formulas that I will show later, where you can put in K any covector, and there you can put also a partial derivative. So this is very interesting, very useful. Uh, and I will denote the antisymmetric tensor with E, not with epsilon, as usual, but mm, it's just because it, it, I, will, I had used that and I don't want to change the notation. So. Okay, what's QFT? That's a bit more thorny. Defining exactly QFT is complicated, but I will use mainly two perspectives. The first one is a path integral approach where the main, the main object is the action, the classical action. Uh, I use the action to define a measure. Action depends on a collection of fundamental fields, which are essentially integration variables. And the uh, action has to have a local form, so it's the integral over the space time of uh, uh, Lagrangian density. And the Lagrangian density depends on the field and its derivative. In principle, it might depend also on higher derivatives, but it's not necessary. Observables are just product of local fields, and the local fields depend on fields and derivatives at a single point, and then one Define the expectation value of, uh, of um, an observable as a path integral. And it's uh, weighted by the measure, the, the observable, and it's divided by the partition function. It's normalized. Another perspective for QFT, which is very useful, is a bootstrap formulation. So instead of taking the action as a fundamental object, one takes the collection of all correlation functions. The correlation functions are correlation functions of local operators, local fields, OA, and these fields span a space, which is called the space of local field. And this, mm, the basis is that one suppose that this field is complete with respect to a certain algebra, which is called the operator product expansion, which is this thing, where I mm, combine two fields at mm, sending x1 close to x2, and I expand them in the basis of local fields uh, with some coefficient c. The fact that they depend on the difference means that the theory is translational invariant. And these fields are just, uh, these coefficients are just numbers, functions on, uh, on, the, real, on the real numbers. And in this uh, perspective, the symmetries are represented by certain specific currents that lives in the space of fields and satisfy the um, continuate equation in this way. Oh, I have to say the, the equality with the twiddle, like this, means uh, weak equality. It means that uh, the identification between left and right is valid only when you put things inside correlation function. Uh, from the symmetries, one can construct the conserved charges as integral over some line in the space. 
And the most important is, of course, the energy momentum tensor, which I will use to construct the operator TT bar, as I will show now. So TT bar is defined very simply. You take two energy momentum tensor, you combine them in this determinant-like form, and then you take the limit for the two points to be coinciding. Nice. Only given this OPE that I showed you here, one might wonder whether the C are finite in the limit where the two points coincide. And actually, they are not finite, but they are under control. So first of all, one of the properties of this T with two, with two arguments is that it doesn't actually depend. The, the expectation value doesn't actually depend on x and x prime. So it's a constant. This means that I can move the points where I want on the plane. And in particular, if I have an infinite direction, so if my, my geometry is not compact, I can send the two points to be as far apart as possible, and then the expectation value of the product becomes the product of the expectation value. And I have this formula here, which will be useful for when I study finite size geometry, finite size spectrum. Uh, as I said, the singularity, uh, they might exist, but they are completely under control. So in the OPE, one can show that everything that appears are derivative of local fields here, and one contact term, which is completely fixed. And this Derivatives do not matter when put inside a, an expectation value because of translational invariance. And the contact term can actually be put under the rug because I can trade it for a, uh, for a redefinition of the space of fields. I can rotate the space of field in a certain way so that I cancel that, that term. So I won't be considering that. And I will say that the expectation value of TT bar is perfectly well defined as the expectation value of this bilinear field T. All right. Now, what about deformation? The point of view of deformation is that of Wilson, essentially. So I would consider the renormalization group. In this context, uh, the series are point in a certain space, which I'll specify later. And for just to, to present what might be wrong about uh, deforming the theory with uh, irrelevant field, I will consider, let, let us consider a theory which lives close to a critical point. Critical points are conformal field theories, are theories that do not possess any, an intrinsic scale. And when I'm in a vicinity of that, I can expand my action as a CFT, a, sum, uh, a term which uh, is a relevant deformation, and then an infinite sum of irrelevant deformations, ir irrelevant operators this way. Uh, relevant means that the dimension is less than the specified dimension. Uh, irrelevant, uh, that is bigger. There might be marginal fields, but I won't consider them because they only complicate the. It's, a, um, uh, it's not useful for the argument, it's just a complication. And I just consider the case where I have just one relevant direction. So what one can say about this action is that the part in square brackets, it can be shown to be a UV complete theory, meaning that if I take just that part there, the theory is completely well defined for any scale of the system. But as soon as I add an irrelevant operator, this property might shatter. So I might lose this property. Usually that's what happens. And the theory becomes what is called effective theory, which means that if I attempt to do an expansion, a usual perturbative expansion in the alpha i, I will find uh, in the Feynman uh, in the Feynman uh, graph, in the, sorry, in the Feynman integrals, I will find uh, divergences, and I need to add counter terms, which in theory I can find. But the point is that I might not be able to fix com uniquely the coefficient of this counter term. So I will, I will arrive at a situation where my theory loses completely predictiveness. And this is called, non, it's called a non-renormalizable theory. This is the usual thing that happens when I add some irrelevant information. Uh, but let, let me investigate a bit more subtly this point using Wilson interpretation. So if I, the central object is the space of quasi-local field theory. So it's a space where each point is labeled by an action. And the action is the integral of a local, uh, so it's a local action, quasi-local actually. So it's the integral of a Lagrangian density. And the Lagrangian density is allowed to depend on any derivative of the field. And the meaning of quasi-local uh, is that I equip my theory with a cutoff lambda. And I ask the theory to be local. Uh, when the, the, the distances that I consider are bigger than this epsilon. But I allow for some degree of non-locality for distances less than that. 
Um, and in this space, the renormalization group flow is simply a scale transformation. So uh, the, the space possesses a tangent space, and a tangent space is the space of fields of the theory. And in that space, I can construct a vector field, and then that vector field affects a flow, and this flow is the renormalization group flow. Uh, L is a log of some length scale. Uh, the integral curves are called RG trajectories, and they uh, encode the, um, the scale dependence of my theory. So how my theory um, looks like when I look it from different distances, from afar, from close. So I can integrate this flow for uh, starting from L equals zero in positive direction, and then I will find large, large scale properties. So I will go to the infrared, and usually no pathology is expected in this case. But whenever I try to go backwards in time, I, will exp I usually expect something bad to happen. And the reason is that uh, if no pathology uh, was there, then I would have an action which is equivalent to an action with a much smaller um, cutoff. And this usually is not the case. So I expect that there is a point uh, under, beyond which my theory exit from this space of, of quasi-local field theories. This is the usual case. In QAD, this is the intrinsic scale where this happens is called Landau scale. So that's the usual name. But it might also happen that this uh, L star is infinity. So I might end up with a nice theory where, which is UV complete. So I can actually remove my cutoff without um, losing anything, without, um, without problems. And this seems to be the case for TT bar. This, again, is not settled, this thing, so I'm not saying for sure that it is, but it, there are hints, uh, quite serious hints, that this is the case. So my theory is completely well-defined. So this is a picture. Uh, it, it's the usual situation, so I have a, a point where I just escape from this space, and outside I don't know what's there, so I just put X under corners, but you know, there is something, but we have no control over what's there, so mysterious. Here is just a pictorial representation of the TT bar flow. It's given by this, so the, I use the operator TT bar to construct the flow. And I can do that because the TT bar is well defined for any field theory, almost any field theory. So the requirements on the field theory where I can construct TT bar is very mild. So I expect this field to be, to be well defined everywhere along this curve. And at, at each point, I can define a direction uniquely. And I can flow along the, the curve. OK, so why? Why consider TT bar deformations? Well, the main reason is that, as I said, the deformation is universal. So I can take whatever action I want, and I can deform it this way. Uh, and this is extremely nice. And all these deformations, they share common properties as, uh, that I will talk about in a moment. Uh, the second part, point is that the deformation is under a high degree of control. We can say that it is integrable in the sense that if I have control over the starting theory, I can find the corresponding quantities in the deformed theory. And I will show an example in the finite size geometry. So I just need the initial value, and then I can just flow, flow things along the TT bar flow. Uh, and and in another important thing is that it preserves existing symmetry. So if I start with an integrable theory, I will keep being integrable all along the flow. OK. And important motivation, among many important motivation, is the fact that even though it seems to be UV complete, the UV behavior is extremely non-trivial. Uh, so there is, um, for example, a Hagedorn behavior, uh, mm -hmm. which means that the density of state uh, is not the usual card, the density, so it doesn't grow <coughs> as a CFT. In the case I'm, I'm starting with a CFT, it doesn't grow as a CFT, but it presents some singularity in the ground state, some square root singularity. In, in other direction of the, of the parameter that I used to deform, I might have some, um, I start from a CFT, for example, so I have an infinite number of state, and I end up with a theory that has a finite number of state, so that where the entropy is finite at, uh, at zero radius, which is a, a very weird. Uh, very weird situation. And I have issues with locality. This, again, is not settled. It's not clear how much the theory is non-local, but it seems to have some degree of non-locality. And then various other properties. Another interesting thing is that whenever I try to describe sub-leading sub critical behavior, so when I have, um, I take the scaling limit of some, some physical system 
exactly at the, um, at the critical point, I end up with the CFT, which is this point here. If, I just, uh, if I'm not exactly at the critical temperature, but slightly away from that, I will find some expansion where the first term are controlled by, uh, by the relevant direction, but the subleading term are controlled by the irrelevant, uh, irrelevant operator. And usually the irrelevant operator with lowest dimension in many examples is TT bar. And from the properties of TT bar, I can find out, for example, the exponent and uh, some relation between the coefficients of this expansion. So having control over the, the formation with this TT bar and with other irrelevant operators is very important also in the context of um, condensed matter, for example. It might have important applications. So these are just two among the important motivations, the one that I find more striking. OK, let me move to the properties. I will try to be brief here. But uh, the main one is that if, you, if I consider finite size spectrum, one can show that the, the energy for any level, so it's a finite size situation, meaning that I have a discrete spectrum. I can label my, my states with an integer n. And the energy for any of this system obeys this equation here. It's an hydrodynamic equation, which is called Burger's equation. It can be solved exactly in terms of the original data. And what one finds is that uh, uh, in the case of a typical CFT behavior, so this is the typical ground state of a CFT, I have a bulk, bulk energy, which is F0 R, and then some diverging 1 over R behavior at 0, where C, C is the central charge. And what this, what this equation does in this plane is affect uh, some affine transformation. So depending on the sign of alpha, I either have a behavior like this, where my energy, ground state energy, goes to a constant that are equal to zero. And this is the situation where, that I told you about where the number of state becomes finite. Because I didn't depict it, but all the higher excited state become complex at some point. And Instead, for alpha less than 0, I have a square root singularity. All the higher excited states are well defined because they, they curve in the other direction. Um, but I have a singularity in the ground state. So I have some kind of tachyonic uh, thing that happens there. And this is called wave breaking in the language of hydrodynamics. So this equation appears when you try to describe uh, waves in shallow water. And it's, it, encodes the, well, it allows for the possibility of the wave to break. And this is exactly what happens. So the profile becomes double valued. And to derive this equation, that's rather quite simple. You just take the definition, use the factorization property, and the standard uh, identification of the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor. So it's quite easy. And one can show that any conserved charge, so if you start with a theory that has more than one conserved charge, you can show that all of them um, so I here is uh, the KDV conserved charges. And they all flow according to the same equation, where the only difference is that I have some spin dependence there. But so the equation is quite general. And here, in this case, the energy momentum are given by this sum and difference. And you can recast this equation into some kind of Lorentz type transformation this way. So there is some geometric interpretation because I have a shift of the radius, which depends on the energy itself. So it's highly non-trivial. And then theta is defined in terms of the momentum and the energy in this way. OK. Another property is that the partition function satisfies this very nice diffusion equation, partition function on the torus. And gij is the metric on the torus. x1 and x2 are the two directions um, that define the parallelogram of the torus. Uh, and this can be obtained in various different ways. One can represent z2, t2 as a sum of states, which is the most direct way to do that. But one can also do something which is called, Hub called hubbard stratonovich transformation, where one transforms the infinitesimal deformation of tt bar by introducing uh, um, an auxiliary metric, h, in this way. Then one works with this thing, and at the end, we sum with h, and one obtains that thing there. It's a bit involved, but it can be done. Um, another way, which is very interesting, is to, I will talk more about this in the next slide. One can introduce a semi-local field, b, which is the curl of t. Uh, sorry, the curl of b is t. Uh, so b is a semi-local field, and uh, 
and then tt bar is represented as, an, uh, as a total derivative and when put inside an integral over the space time becomes an, a line integral but it's a non-trivial integral because b has a tail attached to it so when put inside torus it catches up the two uh, the two cycles of the torus and one can obtain that formula there again this is a bit quicker as a derivation but still i won't present that uh, well, just let me mention that if you start with the CFT, it, 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 it has been shown that this is automatically modular invariant and is the only modular invariant possibility that where all the energy evolves independently along the flow. It has been shown in this article here. Okay, so I, want, I won't show the derivation of the equation for the partition function, but I want to give you a hint of how to derive the S matrix in the general S matrix for any theory. So one introduced the prime form in this way. So effectively, one solves the continuity equation. And BIMU defined like this is a semi-local field. So it has a tail attached to it. And this tail measures the energy momentum across this tail. OK, the OPE, one can show that the OPE is perfectly under control. One can define a, a, com a combined field BO for any field O. And in particular, one can do that for T mu. So one can define this BT field in this way and then this means the tt bar is a total derivative of uh, local fields and of some semi-local field so when i take the deformation and i find the, the infinitesimal deformation of the s matrix in this way and i put what i wrote before inside the integral i can transform it in a line integral on the on the boundary and here the boundary is given by two lines at the past and the future, where I construct my initial particle, I introduce my initial particles and my final particles, and I just integrate over these two lines, this way, uh, using the definition of bt0, one has this expression inside that integral, and one has to see how this object acts on the state at the past and on the state at the future. But this is pretty easy because t nu measure the momentum p nu at x, while the integral here measure the total p mu, the total energy momentum that is lying on the left, all the, for all the particles that are lying on the left of x. And one last thing one has to note is that in the past, the particle on the left are quicker than the particle on the right because they need to collide, while in the future they are faster, so they stay on the right. With respect to, so there is an ordering, a natural ordering of the particle, and if one shuffles things around, what one finds is this formula here, which is very nice. And a nice thing is that it, anything, nothing inside this square, this square bracket depends on alpha, so one can exponentiate directly this formula here and find the full S matrix in the deformed theory. Okay, in the integrable case, uh, you just need to care about two-body S matrix. Well, use the rapidity representation, you can find this uh, form here, which appeared in the first article of Zamalochikov and, and Feder, of Sasha and Feder. Uh, this is called the CDD factor. CDD factor are um, functions that automatically solve the bootstrap equation for S, are ambiguities of the S matrix. Usually one solves in the integrable case S matrix by bootstrap and ones end up with some formula and some ambiguity, which is fixed by requiring the minimal, uh, making the minimal assumption so that it doesn't introduce any poles, it doesn't introduce zeros, it's just something that doesn't do anything. But in theory, one can have any kind of factors of this form, and in TT bar deformation, this is what happens to the S matrix in an integrable case. <coughs> It's, interest, it's important to notice that this phase introduces a gravitational shift, delta t, which depends on the energy. So when alpha is less than zero, the shift is positive, and one has an healthy theory. Although, as I said, probably one doesn't have local observables, but still the theory is well defined. But if alpha is bigger than zero, which is the case where I have a just defined number of states, uh, I have superluminal propagation. Still, the S matrix is well defined, and the theory also is under control. So it, although it's not clear what happens, it's still a theory that I can use to do something. So it will be interesting to investigate this point more deeply. And well, just to mention, the complete S matrix was written by, first by Dubovsky, Gorbenko, and Mirbabai. And it was found by interpreting the TT bar as a coupling to Jacquet-Tetelboim gravity. 
so this is uh, a, um, an interpretation which uh, you, you can look at it uh, as um, so I showed you that you can recast the Burgess equation as a deformation of the radius, as a shift of the radius. So there is some kind of coupling of the energy with the geometry. And this seems to hint at the same thing. It has been shown that this actually uh, bring you to the TT bar deformation of A0. So it is, uh, and from this, um, this action here, you can find the S matrix. You can find the equation for the partition function. It's complicated, but you can do that. And the natural thing to do in this setting is to introduce dynamical coordinates, which are defined like this. And these coordinates are dynamical because they depend on t in this way here. What's the term of fire? Hmm? It's, uh, it's the dilaton, I think. It's the, the field of the, the, the Yes. Yeah, exactly. When you find the minimization with respect to G, you find an equation for the dilaton, which is given by that. And that couples the, G, the, the action with that. Uh, oh, yes, of course, the action depends on G also. So that's why it's coupled to, uh, between the two sides. Um, OK, so this same uh, coordinate transformation has been found by in, in a work uh, which I did with Roberto and Ricardo in a completely different way. So we, we followed a completely different path. We found exactly the same coordinate transformation, which is given here. Um, and this coordinate transformation is extremely powerful in the classical setting because it allows you to map the action, the deformed action, to the undeformed. So not really the action, but the deformed theory in the undeformed theory. And this is powerful because it's a tool that you can use to find the deformed equation of motion from the starting ones. You can find the deformed conserved charges because you can write them as forms. And these do not change on the coordinate transformation. And you can read out the components of the charge once you do the coordinate transformation. And this gives you access to the Hamiltonian, of course. And then in some cases, when you can do that through the Legendre transform, you can access to the Lagrangian density. And you can map solution to solutions between the, the deformed and the undeformed model. So it's a very interesting tool. And the important thing is that you can take this as a definition of the TT bar deformation. I forgot to say also the deformation of the S matrix can be taken as a definition. You can start from that, and then you can derive uh, the flow through the TBA. You, in the integrable setting, you can use the TBA as a mean to extract the flow of the action from the, the formation of the S matrix. Here, at the classical level, also you can do that. Uh, this just, these are just examples of deformed uh, classical Lagrangian density. So if you start from a free boson, you get the Nambugoto with gauge, uh, Nambugoto action, which is ga already gauge fixed uh, in the light cone. So you have uh, two direction which are the world sheet direction and then phi uh, gives you the wiggles of the world sheet in the third direction. And you can put more than one boson in this way and the formula remains the same. You just have to change the definition of phi minimum. And you can play this game with uh, potentials uh, and they, they transform in this way. So this, uh, you can also play this game with fermions with space-time tensors. So he would, mm, Miguel, and we'll talk about uh, Young Mills too. Or, yeah, OK, Leonardo, we'll talk about um, Young Mills too. And let, let me just mention this weird case where you have uh, that Dirac born infield in 4D, and only in 4D, can be seen as a deformation of Maxwell affected by this square root determinant of t. So this is a weird case. I cannot really fit inside this, but I just wanted to mention this strange situation. OK. Now, for how much time do I have left? Uh, what, two minutes? 10 minutes? Yeah, a bit more. OK. Uh, so I can generalize uh, all this setting. The, the most, uh, well, the first thing that one can think of is to take the flow and put another irrelevant uh, deformation. But another way that one can uh, generalize is to take the definition of TT bar as the deformation of this matrix. And instead of putting a simple CDD factor of the type, one can put a generalized CDD factor like this. We can, one can even break Lorentz symmetry, putting S and S prime to be different. 
And in this case, one focuses on integrable system and one can use the TBA or the nonlinear integral equation to analyze the finite size spectra. And this is done by trading. So phi in this, uh, the star is a convolution. So it's an integral of the convolution of phi with L. And phi is the object that gets deformed in this case uh, because it's the derivative of the logarithm of the S matrix. But one can trade the deformation of that by a deformation of the driving term nu. And the reason is that you can split sinh, you can split the dependence on theta and theta prime so that you have uh, some function of theta, usually cosh of S theta, times an integral over theta prime. And then that object usually is an integral of motion. And then you can repack everything inside the, the driving term. So you have uh, some relation between epsilon with alpha and epsilon without alpha, which is given by this. Uh, with this equation here. Usually the driving term, the starting one is uh, of this form. Uh, in the TT bar, everything works smoothly because you have S is one and S prime is one, so you just have a cosh and you can pack everything inside R. So you have an equation which has the same uh, driving term and everything works fine. But in the general case, you will have cosh of S theta. So we'll have to consider something which is called generalized Gibbs ensemble TBA. And to my knowledge, uh, these R's, they do not have a, a direct interpretation in the field theory. So this is a thermodynamics uh, approach. And the generalized Gibbs ensemble you start with has some meaning. So these are uh, Lagrange multipliers in, uh, of higher conserved charge in that setting. But then you look at the TBA and use it to extract uh, information on uh, the field theory, which is mm, another interpretation. And I don't know how to interpret this thing. R11 is the radius, but the others, I don't know what they are. It would be interesting, important to understand this if one wants to use this generalized um, deformation. OK. Uh, another way to generalize is to take the coordinate change as a definition of TT bar flow. And then again, it's simple. One, instead of putting T, put a higher current there, TS. Supposing you have a higher current. Uh, supposing you have a conserved higher current because there is a request that you have to make um, so that the partial derivative with respect to the deformed variable commute amongst themselves, this requires that the, the current be conserved. So if you have conserved currents of higher kind, you can just put them inside that and then work out what happened. And one can show that these deformations are related to a CDD factor of this type. So it does break Lorentz invariance. And they seem to be, they do not seem to be related by a flow affected by a local operator. So this was a comment made by Marc Mezze and Bruno Lefloc. Uh, but still they are very interesting theory. They have a, a lot of uh, particular behavior and Roberto will mention something about it in, in his talk. Uh, one of the properties is, the, again, one has a Burgers-like flow of this kind and it works for any, uh, for any Conserve, conserve current, conserve, sorry, uh, conserve charge, uh, where ES and PS become these more complicated uh, combinations, but the structure is more or less the same. So they again have a, a geometric feeling to them. Okay, so to conclude, TT bar is a very interesting theory. I hope I, I just gave you a flavor of that. Um, and a lot of things are known about this theory. But there are still many questions which are open. And the first and I think the most important one is the question about locality. So how much is this theory local or non-local? Uh, do local operators exist? There is like a complete quantum, quantum gravity-like theory where you have no local observables. So this is not, not completely clear. And of course, this question is important if one wants to define form factors of local operators, because if you don't have local operator, it doesn't make sense to ask that. Um, and of correlators. So there, there, uh, and there was a, an article by Cardi which came out a few days ago on correlators. I didn't have the time to read it. And, well, it seems interesting. <laughs> but anyway, so these are still things that are not settled. And I think they are low-hanging fruits. So they are interesting question which can be answered in a reasonable amount of time. Um, then the nature, the true nature of I alpha bigger than zero theory, 
has been put in correspondence with the in, a, in ADSCFT approach with um, um, the effect of moving away from the from the boundary into the bulk, and in the bulk there is a black hole, and this seems to account for the fact that you have just a finite number of uh, degrees of freedom because you cannot put a, a black hole of arbitrary size in a finite box. Um, it has, was proposed by Magog, Meze, and Berlinde, but. Um, um, I mean, it's still, from the field theory point of view, it's still kind of mysterious what happens. So it would be interesting to investigate this further. And then, you know, you can put TT bar in non-flat geometries. You can have partition function on the sphere on higher gene surfaces. And again, this is not necessarily possible because of the fact that you might have non-local observable. But it would be interesting to understand if it's possible and what can you say about that. And then. There has been proposition for higher dimensional analogs, but this doesn't seem to work too well in the field theory setting. They do work in some cases in um, IDS CFT, from the IDS CFT point of view. Uh, instead, for higher charges, very little is known, so everything goes, whatever result is welcome. Um, and the usual question are just, well, do they share property with TT bar, or do they have novel behavior, like novel UV behavior? Uh, like we say here, um, maybe the finite size spectra satisfy some kind of flow equation. Maybe these flow equations are hugely complicated, and you cannot say anything about that. But maybe you're lucky, and they they are sort of solvable. Um, are all of them geometric? Probably not. Only some of them probably are. And if some of those of them who are, can you describe them as a coupling to gravity, as JT gravity, and that was mentioned before? And also, you can think of going further than subleading critical behavior and then trying to describe the sub subleading behavior by using these uh, more irrelevant operators. And the final thing that I want to mention is that in the context of S matrix, you're not actually restricted to that kind of CDD factor, but you can say, okay, well, those are, have a double exponential behavior, but I can think of trading the double exponential behavior for some poles. These are CDD factor because they are functions that automatically solve the bootstrap equation. So are these things, uh, do they represent irrelevant deformation? So on one side, it doesn't seem so because the cinch gordon S matrix is of that form. But still, you can construct it uh, as a series of, and an infinite combination of, of uh, uh, factors of that kind there. So I don't know exactly what this means. I just wanted to present it to, for some, you know, uh, some stimulation for thought. Um, so they introduce Paul. Do they share properties? Again, can you say something meaningful about that? But the interesting thing is that, in theory, you can use these kind of factors to connect uh, inter integrable theories which have completely different integrable structures, like Singh gordon and Bullock-Dodd. And if it's possible to treat them in some way exactly, it will be interesting to understand what happens to that. So you pass from SL2 to SL3 twisted, and what happens in between? I mean, where do you change? Can you, can you track down the change of this? Yeah, that's interesting. And more interesting, probably, can you reconstruct a massive flow with massless flow, with uh, irrelevant uh, deformations? So, again, this is just a very far-fledged, uh, far uh, far-flung, uh, um, idea, but okay. So I will stop here and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, the simplest example is this one. I flashed through it, so probably it was. Yeah, this one. The free boson. You take the free boson, you deform it, you get the Nambugoto theory. You, you start from the free boson on the left hand side. So, like, think of putting G to be delta. And then, if you do the TT bar deformation, you flow to Nambugoto theory 
where you, fi you fix the, so Nambugoto in the light cone gauge, where the light cone gauge has been fixed, and the field phi that you start with describe the, the wiggles of the, of the worship in that case. And if you put something like sine Gordon or Sinch Gordon, in this case, you get the same action that is written there with alpha tilde, which is given by that expression there. And then this term here behaves as a bulk term and gets transformed like that. So you have explicit, explicit expression. You have, again, a square root. So it is kind of Nambugoto-like. Uh, but it has this, this added part here, depending on the potential. And you can actually do a lot of things, and that we did with Roberto. We computed uh, the lax pair, for example. You can compute them, and it's the way that we arrive at this, um, at this expression here, because you see that the integrable structure is conserved. You still have an SL2 lax pair, and if you write it as a morer cartan form, so you try to look at the, um, uh, for sine Gordon, at the pseudo-spherical surface that is below the integrable structure, you see that that is, not, is identical to the undeformed case. It doesn't get touched by this deformation. Which, so the matrix remains the same? Yeah, 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 it's still SL2, yeah. And the Luxpair gets deformed in a, in a very specific way, but it's still, you can map it back to the original one by transforming the coordinate this way. Thank you.